us begin with the question. What day is it over there? It's Friday, right? Friday, yeah, yeah. Good, yeah. good, good, good. Okay. Well, kia ora, and now my haramai, Father uh, Roderick. I can't say your last name. I'm going to guess it's v- von Hergen. That's actually perfect. You're the first person to pr- to pronounce my last name correctly. Well, I, I, thank you so much. <laughs> I dabbled in a bit of German when I was in uh, school, so I, I kind of understand the pronunciation of the letters and the umlauts and such. But I, I had to practice several times in the mirror before I uh, <laughs> came on the podcast. Yeah. I am in awe. I bow deeply. I'm so honored. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, um, so you're from the Netherlands and you have an amazing ministry online. So I, I originally met you as the geek priest. You came over to New Zealand and uh, mm-hmm. you did a talk for the diocese and I was a Catholic chaplain at the time. So I met you with uh, my colleague Sam, but that was maybe about 10 years ago, possibly longer. Uh, I can't. Do, do you remember when you came over? I think it is about 10 years ago, yes. I actually went to New Zealand twice, um, so I'm not sure if this was during my first visit or my second visit, but it, it's been too long, and I've been homesick, basically, for the for, for the last 10 years. <laughs> I want right. to go back there. Yeah, yeah, and from then I started following and getting your newsletter, and I've, you've always been in my um, kind of sphere of, uh, mm. of, of of where you are and then as i was saying to you in the intro uh we're doing this series on uh, the sacramental worldview and in the last interview with father chris we started talking about the role of fantasy and sci-fi and i've got a few theses i'd like to throw at you i don't know if thesis is the right word i don't think i would stand on that hill and fight that battle but it's a good conversation topic um and i thought the geek priest is the guy to go but then i looked you up and you're so much more than a priest that has a a quirky blog you've got a whole ministry on communication and all sorts of amazing things you run courses and stuff like that so how's that going and what exactly do you do well my my passion has always been storytelling um that's how i grew up as a child with stories with fairy tales with star trek with I always watched it in when I was staying with my grandparents and they lived near the German border. So we were watching that in German. I always thought that Captain Kirk was was German. Um, And then from there, later on, Star Wars entered my life and started dominating my 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 own, you know, everything that I loved about stories and, and my fantasy in combination with faith. And then when I became a priest, I turned that into a ministry. So I started a Star Wars website and I would write blogs. I don't even think that the term at the time existed because this was in 1996. Um, but I just started posting updates on my own website about the prequels that were uh, then being prepared. And uh, But I did it as a priest. And so for a lot of people that was like, that is so interesting. We never see a priest outside of the confi- confines of a church. And this is the first time that we meet someone who's actually in our world. And that gave me the key basically to the ministry that I still do today is always to try to build a bridge between the stories that people love and the deeper layers they contain. And so my ministry is basically has has evolved into a full time ministry. So my bishop has actually allowed me to do this full time. I am still assisting as a parish priest. Uh, but it's basically volunteer work. Uh, but but for 100 percent, I can focus on this ministry. And so what I do is I start with podcasting because that was very affordable and was still re- relatively new. So very quickly it became known as the podcasting priest. And then from there on, I started to learn how to do video and I got a little job at the national TV here as a presenter. And I started to figure out how to make my own documentary. So I started filming my own documentaries for Dutch TV. That's one of the reasons that I actually went to New Zealand because I filmed while I was there, I did a few talks in parishes and on college campuses and in Australia as well. And then actually a friend of mine took me to Matamata yeah. where I filmed at the Hobbit set. And then later on, we went to the Southern Island and uh, other friends gave me their car basically. And so I, I drove all around, all across the Southern Island to visit the Tolkien locations where they filmed the Lord of the Rings. I don't think they were still, they were preparing for The Hobbit. That already been greenlit. And then I 
turn that into a documentary for Dutch TV. So it was such an amazing way to incorporate my love for traveling and exploring new places, my love for stories and my work as a media priest. Mm. And then started to explore what, what else are people interested in. So of course, I, I have a lot of ideas and a lot of stories to tell, but you also need to find an audience. So I was always looking for where is the world looking right now? And how can I connect with that audience? So I did that for Star Wars, talking about the deeper layers in Star Wars, the symbolism, the religious influences on, on George Lucas and the other writers. Um, I did similar things for, for Lord, of, Lord of the Rings, which was much easier because Tolkien obviously is a devout Catholic and has injected a lot of his faith into the way he tells his stories. And then more recently, I discovered the whole world of anime, which was completely foreign to me. I always discarded anime as something for like weird people, <laughs> something that was so outside of my, uh, uh, my, my own world. But by accident, someone commented on a YouTube video that I posted and said, hey, you should check out this anime series called Neon Genesis Evangelion, and it features robots and angels, and it's a lot about faith. And I was like, okay, oh. let's take a look. And then I was like, wait a minute, every episode has so many Catholic elements. I don't, I, I'm not an anime expert, but I do know a, a thing or two about these Christian elements and, and the symbolism. Let me explain that. That got viral. That was in the early days of TikTok. So right now I've got a massive anime following on TikTok. Yeah, yeah. Where videos easily reach a million, two million views per video. I was like, wow. how did I end up here as a priest? <laughs> and that's always like the same reaction. It's like, how how is it possible that a priest knows more about anime than I do? <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. And so it, from there, the last part of my ministry is like, okay, so I I need to to share this. This approach works, and it, it is based. It's built on on the foundation of storytelling, and it helps me to connect with so many people that I would absolutely not be able to reach from within my church, and that my church even isn't isn't connecting with. So I need to pass this on, and that's mm. how I started to build up a, a kind of a coaching part of my ministry where I help other people to do, if they have a message, if they have values they wanna con um, communicate, I can teach them, that could be parishes or dioceses or congregations, but also individual people, uh, because I've, I've done this for 20 years mm. or even longer, as long as I've been a priest for 27 years, I've been using stories to evangelize. And so it's time to pass that on as well. That's so crazy because um, this podcast is part of the bigger apostolate called Evangelion, and I, <laughs> I, I chose that name for this apostolate because of uh, you know, Mark uh, Saint Paul going out declaring Evangelion, the battle is won, and you know all the Christian reasons. And then I realized after we published everything, we got the ball rolling. The anime Evangelion is a massive thing, and whenever you search for my ministry, you find that. And, and initially, I had the same <laughs> reaction as you: as oh, it's a weird anime thing. <laughs> um, but yeah, I've never really looked into it. But also, like the one thing I do know about anime is the people that like anime are massive fans. They're like they're all in. There's not someone who says, oh, "I've watched a bit of anime here and there." It's like I've watched every episode of. I think I think it's generally just one particular one. Uh, I'm maybe one of the only people that has dabbled in in anime. My brother showed me a show called Cowboy Bebop. I got hooked on for a while, yeah. and then That's so <laughs> then I stopped watching that. But yeah, it's so amazing. Uh, the the um, what was it Pope Benedict said that there's an online continent. There's people living there. And we need to reach out to them, and that's exactly what you're doing, what I'm trying to do with this podcast and trying to get some uh, truth, like truth as in the person of truth into these people's peripheries, at least. Uh, so it's such an amazing story. And I was thinking, it's like from from Europe, we've been, the Catholics have been in the media forever with Maximilian Kolbe. He started the magazine and a radio station. And it's just, it really is a, a Catholic thing of and obviously we've got EWTN, Fulton Sheen, all these amazing personalities, and I think yeah, it's one of those things. As I've been going into it more this year, 
I've been feeling a bit like dirty of going like, oh, I need to get more subscribers so that I can spread the message. And I'm like, I don't really want to be a content creator, but I am a content creator because I'm creating content. <laughs> and you're creating the most valuable content con content in the world. This is what people are actually looking for without knowing it. Because they're always looking for the truth, for beauty, for what is good. Um, people are, are, are just attracted to that. And we have that story. It's just that we often wrap it in, you know, old newspapers, and we're not we're not good anymore at 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 translating our message in a way that is attractive to mm. most people, because we have to compete with billions of storytellers all over the world. They all have a platform right now. Like when I started in the media and started working for TV, and I was a podcaster, that was still so very rare. Media was not democratized. It was still in the hands of a lot of big car right. corporations. Podcasting started to make that much more accessible to regular people, even to a simple parish priest, priest like me. And now everybody has a platform, but it also means that our competition has grown so much. There's there's this deluge, this, this tsunami of of stories and content and really good quality content. And so what we need to do is to reteach ourselves the art of storytelling. Because it doesn't really it's not just the equipment or the cameras or whatever, but it's the quality of your story. Does it mm. really help people to redefine themselves and to find guidance in their lives? And that will bring them to you. And 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 that's not that's just not any different from what the apostles did two thousand years ago. Yeah, it's uh, it's crazy. A few times when I like over the years, I had a blog once. Uh, I'm not really a writer, but uh, I was like. It was something to keep me accountable. I was saying, I'm going to do the day, day, I'm going to do a reflection on the gospel every day, and I did that until it was completely unsustainable. And I was part of a uh, like a, an online magazine that went on for a few years until it became unsustainable well, for the editors and stuff. And then I've done podcast after podcast. It was like Gregorian chat, chat was our first podcast. Me and my friend Dom, low quality <laughs> content but lots of fun. Uh, and then I've done one. I did one that was just by myself called the Catholic Life Podcast, and then I had uh, She Bears and He Brews, and then it was uh, now it's the Curiously Catholic, which has been going for four years. And you know, really, it's the same thing. It's me having a desire to put a message out there. I always say, God gave me a big mouth, and I just want to use it. Uh, and one thing I've learned through all that um, path of doing all these different things is the core of what you're saying determines the quality of your output like the first um article i wrote that anyone said was actually any good was one that was reflecting on um the first encyclical that pope francis put out which was written half by pope benedict half by pope francis and then i wrote i wrote that and i gave it to friends like wow this is really good and i was like that wasn't because of me <laughs> i was just reflecting on what they said and it's the same with the gospel and uh you know, we're going to get into this in a bit, but like the difference between and sci-fi and fantasy, or the difference that I'm going to propose is the the core. Fantasy is you typically think of Tolkien, C.S. Lewis, uh, Connery, o Flannery O'Connor, Connery O'Flanner, <laughs> and all these people. They've got this amazing storytelling ability, but the source of it is in the truth and then you've got sci-fi like my one of my favorites is star trek uh, i grew up on the next generation and love voyager and then um the avengers and all these superhero movies they seem to be creating a world where there is no god and that everything relies on us so my, my thesis if you will is fantasy is telling stories with god and sci-fi is telling stories without God. And I guess, I mean, I feel like painting like that is a bit too clickbaity. And it's not really what I think, because I'm here wearing a Captain America t-shirt, so obviously I'm a big fan of it. But what do you think of that? I think it's an interesting thesis. And if you paint the picture in, in, in general strokes, yeah, there, you could have a point. Although it really depends on who is telling the stories and what what do they carry with them in their personal lives and how do they bring that into the story so you you've got in the world of fantasy you've got people like c.s lewis and and tolkien 
and others who clearly have their faith resonating in the in in the values and the choices that their characters and their heroes make um but you also have extremely agnostic and even sometimes anti-christian fantasy where it's super like yes it's it's a magical world so you could say there is a, an invisible dimension but the, the you can also talk talk about magic in a way where, where magic is just a tool it's just a lightsaber in a different genre you know so it it and and the same thing is true i think with uh sci-fi you've got the very at, at least from the outside agnostic star trek where especially gene roddenberry was very adamant about constantly saying this is a world without god people don't need god anymore because there's no money and so people got to get along well but even there over time when new writers start started to contribute to the franchise they started to introduce faith mm. first as a almost a sociological element that is so prevalent in all our cu cultures that they just kind of extrapolated that to other planets well you know if the if if this is just how the world functions then there there should be religions elsewhere on other planets and in other mm. universes um but it was always seen as um something that motivates people but it they didn't really go into is this true or not is this yeah. you know is there veracity is just what does faith do to people and and oftentimes they would take the negative angle where faith leads to fan fanatism or you know or or a, a very ideological behavior which is detrimental to world peace etc but even now over time you see there's there's much more of an opening because sci-fi is reflecting our world and there is also a, a huge huge continent of people that are very sensitive to questions of faith and you see that reflected in in the way that faith is now sometimes introduced in star trek stories and in other stories and you're right um about m the marvel universe and the superheroes they seem almost like proxies i would say for the world of angels and supernatural gifts and talents um but even though these stories may not explicitly talk about faith it may seem like oh it's all about us and we just need to get together form a, a group of superheroes and 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 uh defeat the the super baddies um you could still see that 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 is a almost like an analog way of talking about our own world and about the, the the supernatural dimension in that because they're looking up to these superheroes as gods only to discover that ultimately every superhero has its flaws mm. even captain america ends up swearing at the you know and <laughs> using bad language over time so it, it but it that is also a, almost like a, a a reminder to us that that yes these characters evoke something that goes beyond what we mortal humans are able to do and yet it's still not god so it makes you long for something that is that goes beyond what these superheroes can do and 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 when you ask questions about that you always end up with but what's the values what what is that mm. truth that they, or what is that that true freedom that they say they defend in in their own fallible way and so if you see people and and that's kind of what these superhero stories evoke is this desire for a better world and for well yes let let's defend the truth let's defend the weak and let's let's try to protect people against those that are trying to destroy what's beautiful in the world um but it's it's it so if if we stand for this but even the superheroes that that fight for these values are fallible that doesn't say that these values themselves are uh in a way you know uh, relative or anything so mm. there, there's there are a lot of truths there are a lot of beautiful things in in the marvel universe where i'm thinking you know what it's just a little step further and then you'll end up asking yourself so okay so what are these universal values that all these superheroes seem to seem to try to defend yeah why are, is it so easy for us to identify someone as a bad guy or, or a, an evil genius or a good guy? It's because we have an inner sense of mm. what is good and what is bad. It's our conscience. That's what I. That's the kind of discussions that I try to have in my yeah, ministry. Yeah. Is okay, well, well, you've got the story, but what does it point to?
Yeah, it's interesting because like I said this in the last interview, like the it seems that whenever you've got this uh, hero saving the world story, this um it always comes back to like the 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 bad aliens are attacking us and they want to take over our world but our world is good and we don't know why but something to do with humans being good sometimes and when we are good we're great but we're not always good and that's not good and we should be do the good and so it's like it doesn't actually pinpoint anything and so like again they're grasping at it and everyone knows it's there and that gets into that idea of sacramentality that like especially with like well how do i explain this there is more and uh i think c.s lewis says something along the lines of the fact that we want more or that we're not satisfied by this finite world points to something infinite something beyond us and uh yeah i don't know it's hard it's hard to articulate that without a divine kind of center or uh telos or purpose uh yeah so i think that's kind of interesting and that's where i feel like well i mean i I, again i can't quite pinpoint it with with fantasy but i feel like that's where sci-fi drops off because there is that so so much that focus on the science it's like oh we can fix this with with, if we put bruce banner and captain america and and, uh, and uh tony stark together those brains oh they're gonna do something they're gonna make it work gonna find a, an armor to coat the world um but like they, they don't we we have sequels yeah. we have we have boots we have, so th- that always is a temporary solution it's a temporary state where everything is fixed and we have defeated the ultimate bad guy we have undone the what is it the snap the where, mm. where, where half of humanity was erased everybody's back and then it turns out well it's still a broken world so we need new superheroes we need new stories so it's this ongoing renewal of okay so well we, we thought we were there but this isn't heaven yet we are not at our destination otherwise we have no more stories to tell so it's all going to break down again because we're, we're humans we're fallible we're, we're incapable of creating that permanent eternal stability of of peace love and joy and and goodness and beauty so we 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 we're embarking on a new journey. Fantasy does the same thing. Even Tolkien, at the end of The Lord of the Rings, where he gives us the feeling that the ring is destroyed, all is good in Middle Earth. You know, what else is there to do? The hobbits return to the Shire and mm. just go back to their day to day wonderful life, etc. That, And yet, even Tolkien introduces at the end a, a, a crisis in the Shire. Where after all this magnificent work that Frodo had done, and uh, it, 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 there's still a war to be fought, there are still remnants of evil that are trying to... And actually, Tolkien himself has been working on a sequel. He wanted to tell new stories. Mm. And then he just gave up. Because like, but I'm just doing the same thing that I've been doing in, in The Lord of the Rings. It's the same story. I have nothing to add to that. Mm. At the same time, it was also an acknowledgement that even he, in his incredible creativity and brilliance was not able to conclude that story there was a there was a, an awareness that it's even middle earth in all its glory is still a broken world mm. and and that is i think the basis of our human condition where unless we find our f- true fulfillment in god which is metaphysical it, it transcends our world we will never truly be at peace mm. it's uh, what uh, Saint Augustine is saying, you know, my, my heart is always searching and searching until it finds peace in you, my Lord. Mm. That I th- is, um, it's both a blessing and a curse. It, it makes our life in- ultimately always unfulfilled. There's always something new, new to to want. If I have the iPhone 15 Pro Max, <laughs> then of course I want to have the iPhone 16 Pro Max because eh, it's still. It, I thought it was the perfect device, but no, there's a new one. And, and we do this with cars, we do this with food, with everything. Mm. We always want the next thing. So it, it, it makes our life in, in its essence unfulfilled. And at the same time, it's, it's beautiful because this is what keeps us going. Mm. It's, it's why we keep searching, it's why we keep traveling, it's why we keep telling stories. Yeah, I think uh, I read somewhere that was saying like one of the things that like Tolkien does 
is he doesn't he doesn't so much tell a story but he discovers a world and that's what the lord of the rings is and that's why there's all these like pages of just describing the landscape because he's he's walking through it and he's showing us but like something that's beautiful about it is he creates um like dwarves elves uh, humans he creates these like species and cultures and languages and like in that he's showing us exactly what creation is so you have you know unlike if you look at it from like the the kind of like avengers world like every superhero one ups the next superhero you know you think you've peaked with you know thor captain america tony stark black panther comes along captain marvel comes along it's like who is the strongest i i don't know anymore um but with uh, with with Tolkien, it's a different it's a different uh, kind of superhero. So you've got you've got the humans, and you know you can say we like, we all know humans, we all know the flaws, we are humans, and then you've got the hobbits, and they're just as flawed but in different ways. But they have these subtle superpowers, uh, which it, I just I could talk forever about. Um, and then you've got the elves, which seem to be okay. These are the superheroes, and and you've got the dwarves. And it's like, oh wow, they can do this, but they're all flawed. You know, you all see their flaws, but like not in a uh, over dramatized way, but just in a natural way. It's like, yeah, they can't hold the ring of power. You know, except Tom Bombadil, which I don't know where to put him, but um. Nobody yeah, so... knows. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Um, but yeah, I think I think that's the difference between, like, say, the, the fantasy world and the sci-fi world. Where in the sci-fi world, everything is um, everything has an answer. So, like, oh, I can fix this by building this suit, or I can fix this by Hulk smash this, or you know, with with Thor's leadership, or with Captain America's, you know, um, leadership as well. Um, so it's always okay here's a problem and by the end of the show it's fixed and then like as you were saying with Tolkien it's like okay here's the problem and when it gets fixed nothing changes uh, <laughs> there's still there's. It, I was quite sad when I got to the end of Lord of the Rings and I think it's um, oh, what's the king called Ryder Aragorn yeah Aragorn yeah. and he's he's kind of like he kind of has this realisation of like we've got this time of peace, but this isn't going to last. And, and like mm-hmm. Gandalf's like, yeah, I know. <laughs> and you're just kind of like, oh, okay. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and that's just such a, it's so beautiful in its, like in how melancholic it is. It's like, yeah, and we live for now and we do what we can now to make it, everything as good as we can. And like, I just think there's something so much, so beautiful in that. And you see that in the scriptures as well. If you go through the book of Kings, Hezekiah, amazing king. Manasseh, not so much, <laughs> you know. And yes. it's just like it's it just it's it's so real. But that's why these stories are so highly relatable, and and this is maybe also be why the superhero genre is losing steam, because we see how superficial it is, mm. and how these so-called solutions are not really fixing anything. Mm. It fixes it maybe on a material level, but it doesn't. It doesn't heal the soul. Um, in in the Lord of the Rings and similar stories, you see it that it's a reflection of the world in which we live. But it's always in it's infused with hope that there is a destination beyond beyond this world. The Grey Havens are very symbolic of that. Um, where at the end of the Lord of the Rings, uh, Frodo, Bilbo accompany the elves to go beyond, literally beyond the horizon to a land where you can live so much longer than in Middle Earth, leaving kind of the broken Middle Earth as beautiful as it is, um, to go for an even better place. Um, so it, it, it's an indication that there is more to long for and that our destination, our true destination, is not here in this life. It, it's beyond the horizon. What I, th- I, I was reading up on, on the the whole Grey Haven symbolism. And I always thought that 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 was just a metaphor for heaven. And it turns out that Tolkien didn't even want to go there. Mm. So 
writes about this in his letters. He explains um, that actually where the elves go with 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 uh, Hobbit, the, some of the hobbits and there are a few other people that are granted access to this world beyond the Grey Havens, that's still not heaven. That's not the afterlife. He says there is still, there's going to be even a, a life that is out of reach for me as a storyteller where Frodo goes and Bilbo go and the elves go, that's basically a place where they can heal from their wounds, where they can, where have an extended time to basically get ready for the next voyage, which I don't even describe. It, it's mm -hmm. so for the whole concept of, of eternity for Tolkien is something that inspires him with modesty as a storyteller. He says, I have no, he doesn't say that, but that's what I think as a theologian. I have no words for that because it's literally, it transcends what we can describe. Just as heaven eludes us as theologians and as faithful, we can picture it, we can tell stories about it, we can imagine it. But even if you stand in 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 uh, the the most beautiful chapel or, or church in, in, in Rome and you're looking at the ceiling and you see all these angels, you know, it's just a human image of something that we ultimately really don't have words for or images for. But our images and our stories and our art, our music, our poetry, it, it, it evokes it. it. It kind of signals our heart that there is something beyond what we can grasp. And that's the mystery. And Catholic writers, Christian writers like Lewis, like Tolkien, leave room for the mystery. Whereas in science fiction, there's always this temptation, I think, to fix it, to, mm. to, to end it. And then it becomes flat and boring. And there are a few, a few exceptions to that, like Ronald D. Moore when he did the reboot of Battlestar Galactica. That's already a, a, a number of years ago. But what I loved about the way in which he propelled his story was that more and more over the seasons, you start to discover that there is also like a supernatural dimension to the whole story which at first seems a bit weird because wasn't this all about you know robot cylons and versus uh, an almost extinct mankind trying desperately to survive but then ultimately it turns out that there is like these there are these supernatural beings and it mm. gets all really freaky and very but i love that because it's basically opening the story to a conclusion that is that is not really a conclusion in in this world. It, it, it opens our minds to, well, we cannot really end this story, but on a supernatural yeah. note. Lost, the same Lost, ends with this weird, I don't want to spoil it, but it's this scene in the church. Right. And, and, and you're like, well, what is happening? What, and, and a lot of sci-fi lovers were upset. Like, oh, they're jumping the shark. Whereas I was like watching, this is genius. This is ultimately what the whole story of Lost was about. It's about finding our way to a destination that is beyond returning home and, and leaving this godforsaken island. And so it's, it's a metaphor for our journey towards the heavens. Mm, that's beautiful. Yeah, and I think, I think really as humans, because um, we are kind of, we are built with this, desire for the for the 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 thereafter you know for heaven mm. for for yes. god and we have that regardless and i think that's one of the things i know i sometimes forget like oh truth is true no matter you know whoever you are and so like if you're you know whatever religion or atheist uh it doesn't change the reality of god um it's like uh because Hinduism says, "Oh, you die and reincarnate." It's like, oh, some people reincarnate, some people don't. You know, <laughs> you know, it's, that's that's not a reality. But yeah, I think if you're storytelling, the only way to get a satisfying kind of story is to be like, actually, no, there is there's something I can't put my finger on here, and that is, you know, that's that scratching that itch that everyone has, and like. It is kind of annoying because it seems like a bit of a cop out. It's like, and then I woke up from my dream, you know, as the conclusion to a story is like, and then there was something else, but I don't know what it is. Um, and also the heart of uh, our sacramental life. Um, we use physical matter, mm. uh, we have words, we have rituals, 
And at the same time, what it truly is, eludes us completely. Like I remember that a friend of mine, um, when I was still in seminary, so I, I studied for about five years in Belgium and then another five years in the Netherlands. So my, my uh, trajectory is very long compared to a, a number of my friends who after six years were ordained and I was at the halfway point. So I went to a lot of ordinations of my friends. And, and so I asked them, what did you feel when you, for the first time celebrated mass and you elevated that host mm. and you showed it to the people. And I was expecting an answer of like, a, a transcendental mm. mysterious like how my soul was enraptured with love and joy and almost every single one of my friends said you realize at that moment that you are doing your you are celebrating a sacrament that completely ex escapes you mm. you feel very small because you are you're you're unable to touch what you are actually doing there uh, it, 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 you're lifting up the host and showing this is the body of Christ. And at the same time, you tell yourself or you pray, God, help me believe because I don't have any, <laughs> I don't have any proof about for this. And, mm. and, and this is something that I've experienced as well as a priest. So very often you feel so small, even in your faith, you're like, what I am celebrating something purely. My faith is here that I have faith that this is true, but I cannot prove it. And oftentimes I cannot feel it. And I even have a hard time sometimes believing it, but, but I surrender to it because it is ultimately always, and this is the heart of, of, of what the sacraments are. We're celebrating a mystery and by definition, because it has to do with God and not with me as a creature, it eludes us, it escapes us. It's always bigger than what we can imagine. And the moment I think, now I get it, now I believe it, now I can grasp it, now I can explain it, it's per definition not God, and yeah. you're wrong, because then you're turning it into something human. And so that 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 you can approach that from the point of view like, oh, that's disappointing and that's frustrating and maybe I'm just, it's just a dream and I'm um, just imagining things. But you can always, but you can also say, well, Thank God I cannot explain it. Thank God I cannot truly believe this or grasp this or express this or experience this because it means that there is something still beyond what can fit into my little brain. It's, it's something that, that if I can imagine it, if I can hope for it, if I, if I have a desire for it, then maybe that is because God is ultimately keeping that for later. And, and, and one of the things I always imagine when I when we go to heaven, it's not that all of a sudden we'll understand everything, but it is that through the through God's grace, our heart will fully open to to that mystery. And it's not that, that we're, we're in heaven and now, oh, we have all the answers. What else are we going to do for the rest of eternity? <laughs> that would be the most boring thing ever. No, it's like, oh, we're, we're on the we're stepping over the threshold of a mystery that will always be bigger than us but because even in 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 eternal life we're still creatures we're still humans mm. and so god will always be bigger just like the universe that's always scares me and fascinates me in every opening of, of a star trek series there you have the you have the little intro what happened last week and then you see this shot of this spaceship and it flies through myriads of star systems and if you know that every single star that you see every dot is like our sun and then it's multiplied by gazillions yeah. it's, it's it's just so scary because then all of a sudden you realize well, well, well who am i and what am i and 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 as a child when i would look up at the heavens in you know on vacation and you were in france and there is no light pollution you would see the milky way and and, and you start realizing, well, wait a minute, all of these little lights are stars, are suns, and they might have, and th and what I can see is is just a f infin infinitesimal small part of the entire galaxy that we know of. It scared me so much. I felt so <laughs> small and so insignificant, and who am I? And I'm so totally lost. And, and, and But the other side of that is, this is if this is a reflection if this carries the fingerprint of of the creator and our universe 
is already so much bigger than we can ever explore, then it means that we will always be busy in for eternal life because God will always be bigger. And for me, Star Trek, and that's probably subconsciously so, and certainly not intentional. But when I see that opening shot of, of Voyager and you hear that beautiful theme, yeah. I get emotional mm. because I, that starship is me. I am I am exploring that universe that God created. Just as in, in, in heaven, I hope to be just exploring God's love and just I'm con every moment of eternity mesmerized by everything that that I couldn't even imagine. And, mm. and so there's always going to be something else to explore. It's like human relationships as well. It's like the moment you think you you totally get your partner or you totally yeah. understand your kids and like I there's nothing new. They will always surprise you. Yeah. Yeah. And if you if you cannot see that, if you cannot discover that there is always something new, something you didn't know and you can't control about your kids, about your loved ones, that's the moment actually where a relationship is broken. Because then mm. you think, well, I, I get the other. I know. I define that other person. So it means that, that other person means nothing else to you than what is in your mind. That is a reduction of who that person is, of the mystery that, that a person carries. And that's usually the end of a relationship. Yeah, then yeah. You get like, wait, yeah, yeah. It's always the same thing with you. No, it's not. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I think I think this is what is uh, being touched on in that kind of thing that the sci-fi world is trying to define. What's so good about humans? Why are we so special? And it's two things that you've mentioned um, just in that last response. Um, there is the imagination that sacramental imagination that we've been endowed with by the creator so that we can, in a way, see beyond what is right in front of us. And that fits into mm -hmm. liturgy beautifully. But then there's also relationship. And even if you're not Christian, there is a mystery in relationship that no one can put their finger on. And, you know, Bishop Barron talks about this all the time, saying... Um, you know, you can go on a Facebook profile, you can li read their list of hobbies, favorite foods, where they were, so on and so forth. And then, but then they will do something that isn't on that list. And then you'll be like, oh, this is the person. This isn't just... And so there is that mystery. And it's so weird because we're all human and we all know it, but we also can't define it. But I think the storytelling in sci-fi and fantasy, it is showing us... Um, well, I was thinking as you were saying it, like, fantasy is showing us... Well, both of them are showing how to use imagination. But what sci-fi shows us is how God will work with our plans. Because I think it's like, yes. we built a spaceship, and we built all this technology, and we came up with these, you know, the what's it, the uh, first contact protocols and all these things so we can meet different things and the coolest thing about voyager is going into that even deeper unknown you know uh mm -hmm. and just trying to work it out and fix it and work with other people and build relationships with completely unknown species and such like and uh yeah and so it's like you know yeah we can be scientific we can have science fiction and science fiction isn't bad but it's just showing us a different truth. Whereas like fantasy might be more obviously sacramental. Um, anything with a human or anything tangible in is also sacramental because God didn't accidentally make galaxies. <laughs> you know, he's like, oh, I was trying to make a human and oops, <laughs> I've got all these planets. Uh, <laughs> it was like, and like, I just like love what you were saying about your friend's raising up the host because when I, as I've started to look into the sacramental worldview and start viewing things more sacramentally realizing that it's not just the seven sacraments or even just what's been in the church but I've heard of it described as this and it, it's been more revealed to me as I've been looking into it is liturgy is just playing it's just there. I want to I want to put forward this idea, this truth, 
and I'm going to come up with a series of rules and ways of doing things that's going to make you believe that I'm doing it just as when I do this with my hand it's a gun and when I go pow pow you're dead it's like when I say <laughs> these words and do this action this is turning this piece of bread into God and when you hear these bells and when you see this incense it's like this is the game we're playing but playing games isn't a thing reserved for childish behaviors but it's right. a it's it's, it's a, an, an attempt at conveying to you a desire that's within me and that we all share and it just blows my mind you make a very good point there and it reminds me of um one of my favorite catholic theologians Hans Urs von Balthasar swiss theologian who talked a lot about um that we're part of a what he calls a theodrama in in a sense that the world in which we live the stories that we create the art and everything it's it's a reflection of the great play that God puts up in which we are all playing our part. And, and, and so it's, we're part of a story. God himself is a storyteller. His, the word is literally, it's not just a word, it's Jesus. And what is, mm -hmm. what is the core thing you see Jesus doing time and again? It's telling stories. And it's not because he was talking to children. He was talking to adults, to learned people, Pharisees, scribes. They're all like highly educated people. And yet he tells them simple stories because it is showing us that a story creates room for this mystery, for something that transcends the actual story. And when Jesus uses an analogy or he says, oh, the kingdom of God is like this and this and this, you are actually invited to start playing a part in your imagination in that story who am i what choices do i make and so the story itself creates almost like this this is why i can can preach for 27 years now as a priest about the same gospel time and again because every time i read it there's something else in that story it's something else i discover in that in that room that the story creates and for me this is this is the beauty of mm. storytelling something that Tolkien created with Middle Earth and the stories. It is, it, it's, it, it's always a world where I want to return to. This is maybe also why I keep wanting to go go back to 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 New Zealand because it, it it evokes the same thing. When I'm there, it's like, oh, this is Earth at its most beautiful. And uh, and and the, the, but it is ultimately not because I want to become a Kiwi, um, <laughs> but it's because it. Almost like New Zealand is 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 a, a reflection of the beauty that awaits us later on in heaven. Um, and that's going to be beauty without climate change and all the problems that New Zealand has, and <laughs> and, and and you know all the political problems. Um, but but it so it but it it does point me towards that, and and that's what I love. That's why we I think are in nature. We will always be storytellers um, because. That's that's a, another part of being created at the in uh, resembling God, His own God being a storyteller. Mm. That's why we are storytellers, and 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 what we create in our stories. And this is why why it's so easy for me to talk with people that are not Catholic or Christian. As long as they love stories, I can connect with them, and I can look with them in that story. For what are you actually looking for? And and because the the truth. And what makes us stick as human beings is the same. That that that, and that's so funny with with Star Trek Voyager. They go to the Delta Quadrant, and you see this in Star Wars as well. And recently in the Soka, they actually go to another galaxy. So it's no longer in a galaxy far, far away. No, actually, there's another galaxy. Mm -hmm. And yet, the people that you encounter there, the aliens, the creatures, it's still very much the same way as here on Earth. And mm. and it's so because the, the ground rules are the same. There is this supernatural, how do you say that? It's, it's literally metaphysics that, mm. that it, it, no, no matter how far you travel, you're gonna encounter the same things, mm. um, which, which makes it easier to evangelize because you always have similar talking points. And so, yes, yeah, someone may believe in reincarnation but what does that truly express? Isn't mm. it a desire to live on past this life? Isn't it a desire to do better next time? 
So where does that come from? Yeah, and yeah. that, if you approach it like that, then you can find common ground. You can say, well, hey, actually in Christianity, we have that same desire. We, we, we express it in a different way and it's, we call it heaven, etc. Mm -hmm. But I see elements of truth in your story as well. Yeah, and yeah. and same thing with, with, with liturgy as well. Our, our Roman Catholic liturgy um, is heavily influenced by the tradition in the Western world. But you've got an Eastern lung, you could say, of the Christian faith that has very different expressions, very different liturgy. You've got the Protestant liturgies. And yet, even in the, the most austere Calvinist liturgy, you still have these moments of transcendence mm. where why did you read from the Bible, isn't it? Because that story helps you to imagine something that it goes beyond your current life and your grasp and makes you hope that yeah. you are saved. Well, let's talk about hope. Mm. So. Yeah, and I think that is because, like, yeah, there's, there's so many touch points. Uh, and I think this idea of storytelling has opened my mind to it. It's like, obviously, the last episode was on truth. And what I was trying to work out is like, what is even truth? You know, because we, the world we live in, the modernist kind of paradigm is truth is what you can prove through the scientific, scientific, you know, perspective. Mm -hmm. And that's not wrong, but it's not right either. And we go into it more in the t in that episode. But the same can be said of goodness, beauty, uh, love, um, hate. All these concepts. It's like these are not tangible things but we can make right. them tangible actually um i was watching this uh, movie with my kids uh, yes yesterday the day before i've never seen it before it's called kubo it's on tvnz demand if you want to watch it and uh -huh. after going into the sacramental worldview and looking at it i was like this movie's amazing and it's just a kids movie about them fighting yeah. dragons and stuff uh -huh. and like all the superpowers and stuff but like the teaching oh the teaching on forgiveness was just phenomenal mm -hmm. and it like just it, but you couldn't have told that you couldn't have taught that uh, story without tell, you can't have taught, taught that message without telling the whole story you can say mm -hmm. forgiveness dictionary definition learn it see you later uh, so and so came up with this definition in this year and da 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 and like that's kind of the scientific modernist kind of that's how you know things you you define them and then you find out when it was made but to have that like head knowledge to heart knowledge of like this person forgave in the, the most difficult way and it's like yeah on the cross this is where it happened mm -hmm. they sacrificed everything you know in the story uh, i don't want to ruin it for people but this kid essentially sees the parents die and then the person mm -hmm. that did that has the opposite has the opportunity to destroy and instead the community comes around this person and it and encourages them to be a good person by saying it's uh, i can't remember who i am it's like oh you're a good person you taught me this and you taught me this and then they forgave them and it brought them into community i was like that was such a plot wow. twist oh my god <laughs> and my kids were like is it over can we watch something else i'm like did you miss out <laughs> five-year-olds huh um but yeah like the the opportunity of evangelism it's it doesn't seem to make sense it's like how am i going to evangelize without saying god just quoting scripture saint thomas aquinas says you know this theologian says and i was reading this article and it was talking about this sacramental imaginary is like oh yeah because there's the concept of poesis and i was like i don't know what that means <laughs> it's like how am I gonna how am I gonna tell someone about this? They don't know what poesis is. And so but yeah, I mean it just it makes it human the imagination and the relationship we build, eh? What what I've learned over the twenty seven years that I've been a priest is is my whole idea of what evangelization is has has changed mm -hmm. and I think has deep at first when I when I was straight out of seminary, I thought evangeli evangelization was explaining the truth. Okay, let, let's go through the creed. This is what this means. This is what Thomas Aquinas says about that. And this is how you mm. define this. And, so how, how we, and thou shalt believe. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Every time my homilies were like that, were like three pages of theology, and nobody listened. Nobody <laughs> cared. Because it was 
very intellectual. Mm-hmm. Um, I was I was saying all the right stuff, but it didn't evoke anything. Mm. And over time, but I was convinced that that was the way because the big problem with the church was nobody knows anything about their faith anymore. And this is what you hear bishops say a lot. It's like we need more catechesis, catechesis, mm. course. Yeah, what that would sure. But there is something that should precede it. And that's what I've started to discover over and over again is that before you explain something, you first need a desire. Mm. I can start a cooking show on YouTube, but if nobody's hungry, nobody will watch it. So what I do is this is one of the tricks in how to get a following and how to it's you 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 whet people's appetite. This is why all the TikTok mm. recipes start with it's like someone taking a bite it's like oh my god oh this is so good oh my and then you're okay so how did you make this this is how evangelization should work you should first i think be almost be seduced Mm. by the beauty truth by something is happening with you and you don't know what it is but you've never felt like this before and then then you want to explore the Delta Quadrant. That's where you go, okay, let's ask some of these alien theologians to explain why why it is that it is the way it is. But if you, and, and this is what stories are doing and why it's so essential for the church, I think, to return to its storytelling roots. Mm. Because stories do that. Stories touch us and they make us want something that is beyond what we can see. And this is, um, Tolkien wrote a, an amazing book uh, which I'm sure you're familiar with, but for your listeners, something they should check out. It's it's a book. It's called On Fairy Tales. So it is Tolkien explaining why he tells these stories. And a lot of Tolkien experts say, oh, it's just because he was a linguist and he wanted to create cool elven languages. And then he <laughs> was like, okay, I need to create a world. That is so reductive. Tolkien himself says, the reason that fairy tales, that I tell fairy tales, that fairy tales are important for our culture is that they have the power to make us hope and visualize a world that is not yet there. And he gives an example to clarify, his, and, and he, he talks about someone who's in prison. And you say, you are in prison, the only thing you see are the walls that surround you and the grills that bar you from the outside world. But if I tell a story to that prisoner about a world where the sun shines, where he can walk, for hours and nobody's going to sound the alarm is going to go after him and try to capture him a world where all his mistakes are forgiven and forgotten and it's a world that is that is so beautiful i give that prisoner the gift of hope because that story makes him believe that something is waiting after this time of exile Mm -hmm. confinement um, and if if people don't have hope, they if they give up hope, there is no future. And and and, and I think that is the biggest problem, the biggest issue of our modern day culture, is that. And this this goes back to what you said about science fiction and superhero stories. Often try to just you know fix the world in the here and now. If those stories don't carry hope or a promise of another world that is beyond our horizon, then literally, what is there to hope for? Mm. Where, where should we go? And, and, and then life becomes flat and, and, and we get frustrated by everything that's holding us back uh, because we're created for something that goes beyond our existence. But if you rob people from stories, you rob them from hope. And, and, and uh, I, I love that analogy of the prisoner because in a way, huh, we are all a bit, prisoners in this mm. in this body in this in this mortal world um but we have stories we have sacraments we have the divine liturgy you could say the divine play that god puts up to constantly remind us this is just part one in the play there's going to be a part two there's going to be part three there's going to be an infinitesimal amount of parts in which you will continue that story with me if you let me create it with you and that makes me endure whatever is frustrating mm. and difficult, painful and suffering. Because, I, I mean, the, the one thing that helps me, I've seen this so often as a priest at the, um, when I was visiting people that were sick and wouldn't get better. 
you know, someone with cancer, someone at the hospital, they taught me so much about faith. Faith is, at those moments, it, it means nothing if you can explain the creed to me, or you have your theology in a row. It doesn't mean anything. But what remains at that moment where you are between this life and, and the next life, the difference is, do you have hope? Do you believe, have you, do, can you entrust yourself to this idea that, that, that this is not the end of your life? It doesn't end in failure. This is just the end of part one. And God will lift the curtain again after the brief pause of death. And, uh, and, and then you will discover that the stage is a million times bigger than you ever imagined. Mm. And the lights go on and the, the choirs of angels start singing and you're like, oh, oh my goodness. Thank God I I didn't give up mm. at that last in life, and and thank God this is not the this is this wasn't all that it is. Because mm. then every life end in tragedy and in defeat. Faith and the stories that we tell each other promise us that that just just wait for it, wait for it. We constant we still we see things right now through a mirror that is like after you take a shower and you can barely see yourself, and but but but. Once we cross the threshold to eternal life, the veil will be lifted and we will see what God has in store for us for the rest of eternity. And then you'll understand, yes, that's what I've been searching all my life. I have no doubt that, that when these beautiful artists and painters, when they died, they discovered that oh, that's what I've been painting. And it's so much better than whatever I could, even the Sistine Chapel is rubbish yeah. compared to what it actually is. And, and Thomas Aquinas, a great theologian said, when he got a glimpse of, of what awaits him, when he was on the brink of dying, or I think he fell really ill at one point, and then he, he told his brothers, uh, like everything I wrote is basically just st straw, mm. means nothing. And that, that's the, one of the most important theologians that we have. And mm. when he got a glimpse of, of what God truly is, it's like, yeah, yeah, everything I wrote, everything I dedicated my life to, is, it's really, it, it means nothing compared to what, what God has in store for us. And I'm, I'm like, yeah, bring it on. I'm ready for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's, I, I think that's really like, it's really powerful. Um, the kind of the message of that reality of our sacramental imagination and we brought it to evangelization which is beautiful because that's what i'm trying to do <laughs> this whole ministry let's let's make the whole of new zealand catholic mm -hmm. but it like it starts with helping people acknowledge the gift that they've been given by our creator which is our imagination and we can spark that in other people by our words, our reactions, and our relationships, and the life that we live, we're told in the Gospels they will know who you are by the way that you love. And um, you know, people that listen will probably know I'm a nurse full time. That's what my that's how I pay my bills. And one thing, when I went into nursing, I was really confused because I really felt that God was calling me to ministry, and I'd spent seven years as a chaplain, and I felt like, yeah you know definitely god wants me to be a nurse but how am i going to be do ministry and i feel like god was saying what you've been doing up until now that was for you but now what you're going to do this is for me and it's going to cost so much more for you but it's going to take you further and so when i'm in the the on the ward in in the emergency department mm. the spirit of god is what I try to keep in my heart and I try to spread that through you know my personality of loving people making jokes singing songs and bringing joy into a miserable miserable place and what I guess I'm doing uh, un unintentionally is sparking people's imaginations mm. of love which is ultimately God and I, I'm not trying to toot my own horn here, but just give an example for anyone listening. It's like, okay, so how do I spark someone's imagination? And I think it's just use your own. Uh, I just go in and try and have as much fun as possible and love everyone as much as I can. And I'm an extrovert, so I, I grab hold of people and hug them tight and I tell jokes and I sing songs. But 
do the thing that inspires your imagination and other people see it and their imagination will be sparked and then that starts a conversation of you know there's something more that we're missing out on here and Mm -hmm. that would be an awesome conversation to have someone i'm going to try that one (laughs) but um (laughs) you know something more what you're talking about doesn't matter doing is is you are giving the gift of the holy spirit which is love you know you're you're giving that to the other person but you just give it and it speaks for itself we don't always have to connect mm. that with a religious discourse or yeah, well you know what actually i'm here and i'm taking care of you because ultimately i want you in church praying on your knees eh, it doesn't really work like that i'm here to give you love unconditionally and it's a present and you will unpack it and maybe maybe in the future you'll discover actually where they came where i got it from and 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 we have to trust when we evangelize that the holy spirit is more than capable to suscitate to suscitate that in people's hearts mm. we don't have to control that or make that if if we fall into the trap of evangelization is just education and it's just trying to create a highway straight to church then we are pretending that we are actually the actors when mm. we evangelize not so we're just storytellers we pass on something as tolkien the stories that he told were ultimately stories that he received imagination is that it's opening your mind but you receive the story comes from transcends you it's god who creates that story and you as a co-creator you just pass it on and that and and so we're just collaborators in when we evangelize which makes me comfortable in any situation as a priest, this weekend, I'm going to a fantasy festival. Mm. I'm going to interview people that have never set a step in the church. And I'm going to talk about their values and about the stories that they love. And my my colleagues often say, you're wasting your time. That's not where a priest is supposed to be. Look at all these people dressed up like Dracula and, and, and demons, and you're having a discussion with them? And I was like, I am not there to convince people I'm here to bear witness of what is important to me, and I'm a witness of what is beautiful in the stories of the people that I encounter. And I trust that God and his Holy Spirit is able to work with that, and he will do the rest. I just have to be there. And that's what your work as a nurse is the same thing. You are there. You carry God in you, and you pass it on. You pass him on to the people that you encounter. But then... The moment you give people the gift of your love, you give people a bit of God, and mm. that will start working in their souls, and that will that will start doing its own thing. Yeah. And and maybe this life will never have proof of that it worked, but that's one of the things that we're going to do in eternal lives: meeting all these people that may walk up to you or fly. I don't know how how exactly that work, works in heaven, but it's like, hey, dude. Remember that one time that you sang a song with me uh, at the ER when I was almost dead? Yeah. Well, you know what happened next? And here we are. You know, That's going to be one of the most wonderful surprises is how much the little things that we do are small experiences where we weren't even aware that we were trying to evangelize, but we mm. just try to pass on the love and to care for one another, how much that actually set people on the path to eternal love to the source of that love yeah. and that makes it so much more relaxed to be an evangelizer yeah yeah i think be frustrated like oh my god church attendance is still down despite yeah. all my yeah because i think we've we've always known and i've always heard people talk about how uh you evangelize through your relationships with them and it's like that's cute and it's really nice but it's super vague and really unhelpful um so could you be a bit more specific and there is that desire that kind of science fiction within us that's like i want the solutions i want the six-step yeah. program i want to be able to solve all the problems like i man i want to build a suit around people so that they believe in god or i want to have milnia that will bring down lightning and show show us the truth but um there is going back to that sacramental reality and the the imagination and relationship that is it's some what we're trying to convey is something that's so far beyond the 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 english language or any language so far beyond e- even like latin you know god forbid <laughs> but like it's it's so far beyond that it's like you're not going to 
you know, you said that, you know, St. Thomas Aquinas, his greatest work, he presented it before the Eucharist, and then you were like, oh, it's all straw. It's like, well, if he's not going to do it, I'm not going to do it. But what he did do, and one of my favorite stories about St. Thomas was he, when he needed inspiration, he'd rest his head on the tabernacle. When he was at Mass, at the consecration, he would be in tears. And straight after that Mass, he'd go and concelebrate. At the same point, he'd be in tears. And it's not because of the flower that was used in the wafer that he's lifting up. It's not because of the, you know, the, the liturgy that was being set up into that point. It's not because it was in Latin. It's because he engaged the gift that we've all been given which is that sacramental imagination and he told himself that is God and he believed that and in doing that he saw deeper into the truth of what's happening in that liturgy and we can do that with ourselves and with each other of look deeper into the person that you're talking to and see that God is in them and then yes. that that will that'll change you that will that will that will determine how you speak to them how you interact with them and, you know, seeing that in everything, because the whole sacramentality isn't just within the liturgy and it isn't just the seven sacraments. It is that reality that a tree is what bore cross, the cross which bore Christ. Mm -hmm. A tree, all trees, you know, get, t t tell of that deeper story. And they're just standing there, inanimate, <laughs> seemingly so. Mm -hmm. You know, every every blow of wind, you know, it, it's it, it's telling us a deeper truth because God didn't didn't create humans and then just like ah, oh, I'll, I'll put some other stuff in there. He said, "I want these people to, I want this creation to be with me in heaven, and I'm gonna sh I'm gonna do everything I everything I create is gonna be telling you that story, and we just need to open our the, the eyes of our imagination." And we'll see what God's saying to us right in front of it. And then, yeah, com try and communicate that, I guess. And and faith will then uh, suscitate a desire for understanding. It's, it's It goes both ways. Uh, you know, t t studying theology can make you love God more. And if you love God, you want to study the theology. That's always uh, what, what, what was told. And, and one cannot go without the other. You cannot be a theologian and never pray and never have a relationship with God. Uh, nor can you love God and never, ever do any effort to understand your faith. And, and that's one of the things I love about uh, Thomas Aquinas. If you look at his educational method, it was always question based it was very modern in a way in which he, he wasn't just go let me explain point one point two i've got a nice powerpoint here um <laughs> but it was always okay let's look at some some what's the main question here all right what are the objections all right let me try to answer that and so as always he, he mm -hmm. would start with his students what are your objections what are your questions and that's what i have often experienced in my own efforts to evangelize as a, you could say, as a geek priest, as a, as a, as a shepherd of the geeks, um, is always first engage and try to find the things that you have in common and, and, and have that enthusiasm about the shared stories. And then very often, and I see this almost every day on TikTok now with the anime stuff, you get questions about faith and you get, and, and, I have never, ever said it to anyone on TikTok, like, oh, I'm a priest. I'm actually here to teach you about faith. No, I'm here because I love anime. You love anime. I see stuff that maybe you haven't seen, but I happen to be a theologian. But I never tell them, like, oh, ultimately, this is for Catholics only. And well, I'm so amazed that, that a lot of these teenagers just zoom in on, on religious questions. Who am I? Does God mm. love me? give me because there's a lot of pain there's a lot of suffering among teenagers and they feel like well i can trust this guy because we love the same things mm -hmm. so if i can trust him when he talks about anime i can maybe also trust him when he gives me answers about my deepest questions and for me that that it's been such a i mean it's it's so amazing because then if i explain things i know that i'm not trying to teach someone how to grill uh, a, a piece of meat when it's actually a vegetarian and there's no mm. demand. No, there is a demand. There is a question. So the only thing I need to do is to witness, to try to communicate how I see things and understand it 
even though I, I still feel that I have way more questions than answers. Mm. Um, but in that, every time I try to explain the faith and, and catechize, it is because there was a question first. Mm -hmm. If there is no question, then it becomes uh, proselytizing. It becomes like forcing someone to believe. It's and, and that never works. That only creates more apprehension. And all of these church people always know better than I do. And But if you start with love, with stories, with the, the, the things that God has given us to share, then there is no doubt in my mind that at one point, and maybe I'll, I'll witness that, and maybe not, maybe it, it'll be for someone else to see that, but, but that Holy Spirit will start to ask questions and people will start to inquire and look for, okay, so but what am I actually looking for? Mm. Man, this stuff is so good. I love this. I feel like we could talk forever about this, but we're getting onto the hour and 20 mark and uh, my kids are in bed and I need to crack on with a few things. And I'm sure you've got the rest of your day ahead of you. Um, yep. So if a few things, uh, anything to sign off with, but also then we'll ask you a bit about your work, where people can find you, uh, etc. So what would you sign off with? The best way to see what I do um, is to go to my website, which is very simple. It's fatherrodrick.com. And uh, if there are people that would like to um, see a bit more of, of this ministry, I post like little blog entries. I have links to my various channels so they can just sample what I do. And, um, and I'm one of the things that I hope is that I can pass this on and help our church, our parishes, our also individual pastors. What I do is not rocket science. It is something you can actually learn. And, mm. and um, so I, I always offer, like, I'm able to help. I was actually because it's my job. So mm -hmm. <laughs> that's what my wants me to do is to help other people to to spread the gospel. So if they need coaching or anything, just take a look at the website and let's let's work together. That sounds wonderful, and I think I definitely will be uh, contacting you regarding that. I've just started to work on making shorts and with varying success. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's a, that's a whole story from the time. Anything else you want to say on the whole fantasy fiction, science fiction, sacramental reality? Well, I would say for those of you that are listening in, and you live in New Zealand, um, I would say you have an incredible treasure for evangelization. I, I, I once went to uh, Queenstown and I stayed with the local pastor there. He's no longer there. Uh, there's another pastor, but, but I stayed at the rectory for a week. And we talked every morning after mass about, you know, faith and how can you, because there was almost no church attendance because it's a very touristy place. And so church was basically almost empty uh, during mass. And I said, you know what? But I, 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 this is what I would do. I would start organizing retreats here in Queenstown for Tolkien fans. And we'd go take a walk and go to the places where they filmed, you know, the elven scenes or the, you know, and it's, you have a lot of touristy tours. I was like, I would just start a company and I would do Catholic Tolkien tours. Let's go explore and let's evangelize all these Tolkien fans. And there are billions, well, not millions, there's certainly tens of millions yeah. that are loving these stories. They love the country. They love the, to, to go to these places because we want to touch. We're very Catholic in that way. We want to be yeah. where heroes were and imagine ourselves to be there. And then I would say, I would inject that with, with, I would turn it into a pilgrimage. I would say, I'm, I'm going to let you discover the true secret of Middle Earth. And we'll go explore what makes these hobbits and these elves ticks. And then you would, I would, I would pay for that. I would, go, I would yeah, travel to yeah. New Zealand to have that experience and to enrich my experience of these stories by, by but so the church in new zealand has a fantastic opportunity for evangelization mm. uh, so that, that that's just a little brain wave that i I'm had when it. i was there and i'm doing it that's I, what that's what i'm gonna I, do work. we should start working on that and you know what you could just go in queenstown and Put up a, a little advertisement like, hey, you, you want to go on a real Hobbit tour and you want to go with an, an expert on not just the story, but also where the story comes from. Join us. And I think people will even pay for that. So yeah, anyway, yeah. that's my. Yeah. If you guys listening want to see that happening, 
you know the Evangelion bank account. We're going to make it happen. Let's uh, start funding us so we can start funding you and we can get some cool things happening in New Zealand. I think God has a lot in mind for us. He created us with imagination. He gave us the seven sacraments and he gave us an imagination so that we could see God in all things. So let's go and invite other people to doing that. Thank you, Father Roderick, for joining us and for all you listening. Hang on a second. For all of you listening, thanks for listening. Thanks for getting involved, and I want to encourage you to like, share, and subscribe. We're trying to get to 20,000 subscribers on YouTube, so if you know roughly about 19,900 people, get them to subscribe to my YouTube channel so we can get more speakers, more funding, and more evangelization in New Zealand. Thank you for joining. God bless.